thank you again also for inviting me over to speak about one of my passions, obviously, is uveitis. Um, I'm more than happy for people to interrupt me halfway through. Um, it's a small group. Very, very happy to just answer questions as we go. Um, also, um, I'm quite happy to get kicked off the stage by you if I go over time as well, because I do tend to uh, talk too much sometimes. Um, so what I'm going to do is give three lectures. The first one's just an introduction to uveitis and how to approach uveitis, mainly going through quite a few cases to illustrate these points. And then we're going to talk about the treatments and the available treatments and when should we actually think about which treatment we should use. And in that um, talk, I'll be drawing upon a lot of the trials data and a lot of the clinical trials um, results that we've actually been involved in in um, Melbourne, Australia as well. And the last talk will be about um, how to approach patients with uveitis um, at, who require cataract surgery. So just to start off with, um, again, with this first talk, I'm just going to talk through some basic principles in uveitis and then um, really concentrate on um, posterior uveitis, which is the form that we actually worry most about, even though it's the rarest. So just to start with, um, just with the case, I had a, a young boy, seven-year-old boy, who has four other brothers, and they were playing cowboys and Indians in the backyard with real arrows. Unfortunately, one of his brothers um, shot an arrow, ooh, shot an arrow, which unfortunately missed the target and hit him in the right eye instead. And so, this is his right eye after two operations to try and sort of piece it all back together again. And six weeks later, he actually comes in with bilateral sore eyes, severe photophobia, bilateral ocular injection. And as you can almost predict, he has now problems in the other eye six weeks after that initial injury. And if we have a look, you already know that the right eye cannot see given those pictures that I showed you before. But this is the picture of the left eye. And you can see here, he's got a granulomatous panuviatus in the left eye, as illustrated by this um, angiogram. So obviously, the diagnosis in this young fellow, bilateral panuviatus, post-penetrating eye injury, this is a case of sympathetic ophthalmia. So what this requires is aggressive in, uh, immunosuppression, both local and systemic. This is a condition that does not stop. And so these are patients that require systemic immunosuppression, which he received and we're able to save the sight in his left eye, which is something if we did not do, he would go blind in both eyes. So what is uveitis? Certainly when I was a medical student and even as a trainee ophthalmologist, this was something that I actually had a lot of troubles trying to actually get my head around. Obviously we know itis, like arthritis, means inflammation. So in arthritis, that's inflammation in the joint. So uveitis is inflammation in the uvea. But one thing I always had trouble trying to understand is what is the uvea? And so what the uvea is, as you can see here, it's the actual vascular coat on the inside of the eyeball, going from the iris all the way back to the choroid down here. And so therefore, uveitis refers to inflammation inside the eyeball, okay? And it encompasses all of these terms, anterior uh, uveitis, iritis, pars planitis, choroiditis, retinitis, these are all inside the eyeball, so they all fall under the umbrella term of uveitis. But I know that you also sort of sit there going, okay, uveitis is inflammation of the eye, but how about episcleritis, scleritis, myositis? These are all inflammations too, right? But they are different. So, um, trying to get my... Um, So let's just go back here. Okay, so basically uveitis, the uh, episcleritis, scleritis and orbital inflammation all sit under that umbrella term of ocular inflammatory disease. Okay, so uveitis is inflammation inside the eyeball. Scleritis and episcleritis is inflammation of the eyeball wall and its coverings. And orbital inflammatory disease is inflammation outside the eyeball but inside the bony orbit. Okay, so that's how we split them all up. If we look at the causes of these conditions, it's just the same as how we approach any other systemic disease, okay? You've got infectious, non-infectious, and then you split it up into ocular versus systemic, autoimmune versus idiopathic, okay? You might sort of sit there going, well, okay, it's the same as any other disease. What, why should I actually try and determine between uveitis 
and say scleritis or orbital inflammatory disease. The reason it's important is because the diseases that you're looking for actually depends on the anatomical, defi uh, anatomical um, definition or where that happens to be. Uveitis is typically associated with the spondyloarthropathies, that's the anterior uveitis, and then it's sarcoidosis, Bechet's disease, Voigt-Coyanagi Harada disease. However, scleritis and peripheral ulcerative colitis are associated with the systemic vasculitides. So we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, granulomatous polyangiitis, lupus, and relapsing polychondritis. Okay, so quite different diseases that we're looking for, depending on where the site of the inflammation is. Okay, so why should you care about uveitis? After all, around the world, it accounts for less than 1% of all ophthalmic conditions that you will actually see. However, it punches above its weight with regards to the rate of irreversible blindness. Certainly at the INE Hospital, it accounts for 30% of blindness in my institution, even though it's less than 1% of all the ophthalmic presentations. The other thing also is that unlike more con common conditions like glaucoma and age-related macular degeneration, uveitis affects the young. It affects people like you who are working and therefore the economic cost to society of uveitis is far greater than these other conditions that blind you when you're old and have already paid your taxes. Okay, you're not trying to support your family when you're a lot older as opposed to all of you. If you go blind now, it's a much higher cost to society. So that's why it's important and that's why it's one of my passions. So how does uveitis present? Okay, a great gamut of symptoms, okay, from photophobia and redness, bit of ache down to loss of vision. It can also present acutely, which is usually when patients have pain. So when they have photophobia and pain, they're more likely to present acutely. However, it can also present insidiously, so slowly builds to vision loss. So these patients usually may not have much pain, but actually will present with floaters, photopsia, and eventually foggy vision and loss of vision. So what I'm going to do now is now that we've sort of covered off the anatomical classification of inflammation, I'm going to actually go through each of the types of uveitis because again, the type of uveitis that presents to you will help give you an indication of what the disease associations are, or what the cause is. Okay, so anterior uveitis is obviously inflammation concentrated at the anterior segment of the eye where the iris is. So that's why we call it iritis. And the classic signs, obviously, are ciliary injection and, of course, the KP and the posterior synex. Intermediate uveitis is inflammation concentrated within the vitreous, the vitreous cavity here. So you may see some at the front, but most of it will be in the vitreous. Okay, and that includes vitritis, which you can see here. This is the classic headlight in the, in the fog sort of appearance. And, of course, pars planatus, which is a subtype of intermediate uveitis where you see the snow banking and the snowballs, and with venous sheathing, that's the type that we usually see with multiple sclerosis. Posterior uveitis is where the inflammation is really concentrated in the retina or the choroid, as you can see here in this case of CMV retinitis. Okay, and it's because it's involving the retina and the choroid, this is the most blinding form of uveitis, and this is the one that we don't want to miss. Okay, and so this is very important, even though it's rare, it's the most highly blinding. Pan uveitis is obviously when each segment of the eye is equally affected. So as you can see here, the anterior segment is very inflamed, but so is the vitreous, the retina and the choroid. And we typically see these obviously in infections, but also in Bechet's disease and sarcoidosis. Okay, so the challenges for all of us when we see an acute case of uveitis is trying to work out what to do with these patients. What are you dealing with? Do you need to order any investigations? Do I need to start treatment? And when should I start treatment and what should I use? The challenge, the major challenge, particularly with acute posterior uveitis, is determining whether or not this is infectious, okay? Because most of our treatments for autoimmune cases is immunosuppression, whether or not that's topical eye drops, injections, or tablets. And so that's the last thing you want to give a patient if they've got an infectious cause for their uveitis. So how are you going to tell between the infectious causes and the non-infectious causes? Okay. 
the key question and the, mm, sorry, this is not advancing. Um, sorry, it's not going ahead. Can you advance the slide? Oh, okay. Uh, go up. Oh, no, no, this is way ahead, sorry. Um, nope, uh, actually export. Way up. Yeah. No, that's okay. Okay, here we go. So, right, the next one. Yep. That one. That one. Oh, it's hanging. It's hanging, is it? Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. That's the thing with technology, isn't it? It's great when it works and it's not great when it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So how do you tell between the infectious causes and the non-infectious causes? And essentially it is to take the time and actually do a thorough history and examination of your patient. There is no magic blood test. There is no magic radiology test that's going to help you determine between infectious and non-infectious that is better than actually asking the patients a few more questions and doing a thorough examination. With, um, so take a good history, look at the eye, look at the patient, look at the pattern of the uveitis. Okay. And then determine whether or not you need to do any investigations based upon what you see. Um, uh, whilst we've got a little bit of a technical issue, are there any questions at this point in time that people might want to ask whilst we're getting things sort of set up? I know we've just sort of started, but um, yes. Thank you, Professor Linda Lim. Uh, I have a question. Maybe uh, I'm interested in your first case mm -hmm. about uh, one boy with head and sympathetic ophthalmia. Yeah. Um, uh, my first question, uh, do you think if you have one patient with that symptom and that disease, do you think uh, it is uh, under treatment in the first, from the first doctor to be a sympathetic ophthalmia? And when do you uh, decide to do an inoculation? Yeah. Because we are, uh, it is a rare um, treatment in here. Maybe. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, so basically the issue of enucleation in a penetrating eye injury, so back you know, a few decades ago when I first started, it was always you must enucleate within two weeks of the um, penetrating eye injury if there is no visual potential to see whether or not we can actually prevent sympathetic from occurring. That's actually now changing a little bit in that people are saying that if you actually um, recognise the symptoms early and treat them appropriately, it doesn't make any difference to the incidence of sympathetic ophthalmia. Now, that's very easy for me to say working in a metropolitan in metropolitan Melbourne where patients are you know very close by and it's very easy to monitor these patients but if I have rural patients who are not likely to be able to come in for regular follow-up and um, are, not li are not likely to be compliant you may actually start thinking about well look you know this is going to end up being a blind and painful eye which is exactly what happened in this young boy that they might actually be better off having the enucleation first up but it doesn't mean he will not develop sympathetic on the other eye. It just You do still need to warn them about it. Um, it, will, it can still happen. So, um, you know, it, it, is, it is one of those things that we sort of thought that it would prevent it, but it may not. The key here is to recognise it early and to immunosuppress very, very quickly because it can be 
be aggressive, which is essentially what happened with this young boy. So um, yes, it is still an area of contention, but now early enucleation is not really something that, um, that we practice very often now. Mm. Um, you know, and the issue of sympathetic actually is now becoming, we are finding the incidence of sympathetic now occurring in patients who've had multiple intravitual injections for things like age-related macular degeneration. And so certainly in, um, in uh, metropolitan areas in Australia, we are now seeing more cases of uh, sympathetic from multiple surgical procedures than, um, than penetrating eye injuries nowadays because of better understanding or pu better public health um, arrangements with regards to health awareness and eye protection. Um, one of the major things actually in Australia that changed our rates of penetrating eye injuries was actually seatbelt laws. So um, 20 years ago, um, we had no seatbelt laws for people traveling in cars. And so we had a lot of people going through windscreens during um, car accidents. And that's where all of our penetrating eye injuries were occurring. And now we've got compulsory seatbelt laws in the front and back seats. We're actually not seeing those injuries quite so much. So sympathetic's not seeing what is something that we're not seeing as much as we used to. Um, I'm not quite sure about here in Indonesia as to whether or not you're getting a lot of penetrating eye injuries. Um, do you see a lot still? You do? Yeah, so this will be more and more of an issue. And certainly I'll talk about the systemic immunosuppression of these patients in the next talk, um, because um, certainly this is clearly a, more of an issue for you guys than it is for me nowadays. Um, uh, any other questions? No? We're almost ready to start up again. Maybe from um, the audience who joined the webinar. Is there any questions? Oh, yes. Oh. Uh, thank you, Professor Lindo. I would like to ask about uh, the next questions regarding Dr. Rainey's questions before. Uh, you said that we should give immunosuppression treatment for the ocular penetrating injuries. And we see many, many cases of uh, penetrating injuries and lacerations on the eyeball. And uh, what I'm wondering is, how early should we start giving the patients immunosuppressive therapy and what kind of ocular trauma or penetrating lacerations kind of thing uh, that we should give uh, them the therapy and for how long and for uh, how much is the dose for the patients when the patients has not yet developed the symptoms. Mm. Thank you. So basically all treatments have got side effects and ramifications. And so essentially, I'm not advocating starting systemic immunosuppression prior to the diagnosis of sympathetic. Certainly there has been, and this is totally unvalidated by trials because it's such a rare disease, but some people advocate that if you're actually having multiple operations, this includes VR surgery. It's mainly vitreoretinal surgery where this becomes an issue of multiple VR procedures that you're starting to increase the risk <coughs> of systemic ophthalmia in, that, and, um, in these sort of situations. And they advocate giving you know, a bolus dose of um, corticosteroids IV, so methylpred or hydrocort, um, intraoperatively at the time to try and prevent um, sympathetic from occurring later on. Now, whether or not that um, translates into penetrating eye injuries um, to try and prevent sympathetic, I think is not it's not proven and there are risks because obviously with the penetrating eye, op, um, eye injury, there's always that risk of infection as well. And obviously if you have, you know, endophthalmitis or panophthalmitis from your penetrating eye injury, that's also going to be a very pro-inflammatory event in itself. And so I wouldn't actually be advocating starting systemic immunosuppression in these patients. Um, it's only when they get diagnosed with the sympathetic that we would actually do the systemic immunosuppression. Um, but not, not prophylactically. And it's very hard, I think, to um, do a study of this um, with regards to, you know, if you're going to have to do VR surgery to repair these penetrating eye injuries, longer term, do we have to um, give them a bolus dose at the time of surgery? It's very hard to set up a, a trial to actually prove that. Alrighty, thank you very much. So I might um, try and <laughs> finish this talk. Okay, so essentially with regards to um, working up your patients, Look at the pattern of the uveitis, as I said before. Is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? Where is the seat of inflammation? Is it anterior? Is it intermediate, posterior or pan? This will help you determine what the likely associated diseases are or what the underlying diseases may be associated or any infections. Again, look at the patient. 
Okay, there is always more to your patient than just the eyes. And this is something that I always have to remind my trainees that the answer, as you can see in this gentleman, is often sitting right in front of you. So this is a patient with ankylosing spondylitis. If he comes in with an acute anterior uveitis, you already know why he's got his uveitis most of the time. Okay, with regards to investigations, one of the um, things that my trainees often do is that they basically see uveitis, they don't bother actually asking a lot of questions and just reel off a whole lot of investigations. Now the problem is, is that you're, if you're not likely to get a positive result, you're more likely to get a negative, a, a false positive that you don't know what to deal with. And I'll explain this to you in more um, detail, but it's all, it's all there in Bayes' theorem but essentially Bayes' theorem is simply saying if the pre-test probability of your test is less than 50%, there's no point doing it because you're more likely, if, it, if you get a positive, it's more likely to be a false positive that you don't know what to deal with, okay? Having said that though, we do a syphilis in everybody because I'm not quite sure about here in Indonesia, but worldwide, we are in a syphilis epidemic. Um, the rates of syphilis are increasing worldwide and this is something that we have to always keep in mind largely because we know that syphilis is the great mimicker in uveitis. It can present in any ways, as you can see here. On the, and these are just some recent examples from my hospital. We are getting one admission per week of syphilis in our institution. Okay, so I'm going to go through some cases because I think that's often the easiest way to actually think about how to manage our patients, how to work them up. So, okay, so the first one, 18-year-old, previously well male apprentice, he comes in with, or referred in, with a 12-month history of bilateral acute anterior uveitis. Well, that's what the initial diagnosis was. His vision initially was good. You can see here some classic signs of anterior uveitis with the ciliary injection, 2 plus AC cells, always responded really well to the prednephrine fort, so topical steroid therapy, but every time it was tapered, he always would have a relapse of his uveitis. However, the reason he came to see me is that unfortunately with one of these episodes, he had a sudden onset of bilateral blurred vision um, associated with the worsening of his uveitis despite ongoing prednephrine fort therapy. He was told by his uveitis specialist, uh, not his uveitis specialist, he was told by his original ophthalmologist that don't worry, you know, it's probably cystoid macular edema that's causing your drop in vision. You'll, you'll do fine with just an increase in drops or maybe a short course of steroid tablets. However, it's not, and I'm not quite sure how well this is projecting, but this young man unfortunately has a progressive retinal vasculitis, which was missed and was probably there 12 months ago. I don't know if you can see this very well, but he's got widespread retinal hemorrhages, but it's probably a bit more apparent here on the angiogram. You can see here he's got blocked fluorescence from the degree of retinal hemorrhages here on the left-hand side, and that explains why he's got such poor vision. And this is the right eye. Again, you can see the retinal vasculitis here. He's got NV everywhere. So you know this is not an acute presentation. He probably had this occlusive vasculitis for many, many months, if not at the initial presentation. So the key here, obviously, is that you have to dilate your patients. Fortunately, he did very well. We gave him oral prednisolone, a lot of polarization. He ended up with... I hope we haven't blown anything. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> so that young man actually did quite well in the end, um, but it does highlight the importance of patients who present with what you think is a rip-roaring anterior uveitis. You must dilate that pupil. You've got to dilate that pupil. You've got to have a look at the retina because that young man's blindness was entirely preventable if it was diagnosed early, okay? And so you are not going to be able to find this until you dilate that pupil. I think we've blown maybe the projector perhaps. Um, any other questions? <laughs> Standard for diagnosis of syphilis uveitis. Sorry? The course standard for diagnosis of syphilitic uveitis. Oh, syphilis. Yeah. yeah so basically. You, yep. you make uh, maybe uh, in the camera 
paracentesis or? Uh, we just do serology. So um, basically, you know, it's, we start, it, everyone gets just the, something like an RPR to start with and an FTA, um, so a non-specific followed up by the specific um, serology. So we don't actually do ocular samples for syphilis, we actually just do the blood test. So everyone gets the blood test for syphilis um, and I think, you know, as, as you probably know, um, you know, with syphilitic uveitis, this is neurosyphilis, um, this is something where the RPR may actually be falsely negative or low and that's where you need to do um, the um, specific tests with something like FTA absorbed or something similar or TPHA. But that's what we're doing. Yeah, so we don't actually do ocular samples for syphilis. Um, and again, um, with syphilis, you have to ask for those systemic associations, the rash on the palm of the hands. There are not many things that causes rashes on the palm of the hands and uveitis, but syphilis is right up there. Okay, so back to my young man with the retinal vasculitis. Um, again, after a lot of um, treatment, we actually managed to get his vision back from um, 660. So he did actually do quite well. But again, he could have done a whole lot better if this was diagnosed a lot earlier. Okay, so this next case, another 16-year-old um, uh, high school student comes in with what was thought to be an unresponsive granulomatous anterior uveitis. So he had this typical symptoms of photophobia, um, and then develop some floaters and decreased vision despite hourly prednephrine fort. And so you dilate the pupil and you have a look inside and this is what you see. So he's got a vitritis, at least got a significant vitritis. Now, if you stayed on the slit lamp and did not do anything beyond this, okay, you're going to miss his diagnosis because if you actually then from here sort of sit there going, okay, that's a significant vitritis, I can't see anything here. Okay, I need to look harder. Okay, what you need to do is put your indirect ophthalmoscope on. Okay, because with the indirect ophthalmoscope, you will see this. Okay, so this is a peripheral area of retinitis here. Okay, with vascular, um, with some vasculitis in that area. That diagnosis is acute retinal necrosis. Okay, and so this is not what you want to miss. Okay, again, it's a blinding disease. All right, and so my little tip to you is that if there's any sign of significant vitritis in there, you have to use your indirect ophthalmoscope because the indirect ophthalmoscope is the only piece of equipment that you have there that has the wattage to be able to get through the vitritis to find these focal lesions that will give you the diagnosis. No fancy investigations here, it's just all in your hands. Okay, so use what you have available to you. It's the cheapest thing, okay, and it's there and then, okay. It's the only way you're going to get through the vitritis. It's the only way you can see those, uh, those peripheral lesions because they all start peripheral with acute retinal necrosis. Okay, so a few points on ARN. The diagnosis is clinical. This is, I cheated a little bit. This is porn, but, um, you know, because there's not a lot of vitritis there. But this is the retinitis that was evident a lot more peripherally in my previous patient. Okay, classic wide out of the retina with that feathering of the vessels going through those areas of retinitis. The diagnosis is clinical. Yes, you can confirm the diagnosis with an AC tap or a vitriol tap. The AC tap's not bad, but if I'm going to go in, I usually do a vitriol tap unless I feel that it's a high young myope and, that, you know, and I'm worried about pulling a tear. But I usually do a vitriol tap because if I'm going in there, then I will inject some foscarnet and I will show you with the next case. But sometimes when the diagnosis is unclear, that's when I'll do a vitriol tap as well. So this is acute retinal necrosis. This is the second case, uh, a young boy, again, who was referred in with vitritis, vasculitis, and a secondary retinal, vein, a retinal artery occlusion. And you can see, I'm sorry, they're not projecting particularly well, but you can see here that there's a lot of sheathing of the arterioles here, which is why they thought there was a central retinal artery occlusion. But actually, again, if that initial ophthalmologist had actually put on their um, ophthalmoscope, their indirect ophthalmoscope, they would have picked up these fairly typical peripheral lesions. So this is toxo. Again, you don't need anything fancy here with regards to diagnosing this, okay? And certainly in Australia, this is the top cause for posterior uveitis in my institution is toxoplasma. Okay, again, all three of those cases, 
have illustrated that your patient has not presented with an anterior uveitis until you have dilated that pupil and have excluded posterior segment disease. Okay, you must dilate those pupils. Okay, a few words on toxo. Okay, commonest cause of posterior uveitis in most parts of the world. Okay, it's most commonly a reactivation of a primary focus, as you could see here in this young fellow. Okay, they may have anterior uveitis, often hypertensive. Okay, and they get that classic pigmented lesion with that reactivation right next door to it. So again, it's often a, di um, a, a diagnosis that you can make on examination. However, primary infections in adults can occur, as you can see here, just a focal area of retinitis, okay? And the classic punched out pigmented lesion will only occur after you've treated this, as you can see here in this case here. So when you see this, you sort of sit there going, that could be anything almost, all right? And it's only when you see this, and you say, well, okay, that's toxo. It's in these sort of situations that you sort of sit there going, what well, could be an unusual aunt? These are the cases to tap. Okay, so even though the diagnosis is often clinical, in these sort of situations, it's not always that clear. So what sort of test should I do? Okay, so you can do a toxoserology. Now, 95% of the population will have, have been exposed to toxo. Okay, so their IgM is going to be positive. In these situations, I find the toxoserology is very helpful if it's negative. Okay, because if it's negative, it's less likely or far less likely, I've ruled out toxo then, then I'm more likely to think about other alternatives such as acute retinal necrosis. Okay, now the toxo PCR is not particularly, it's, it's not as robust as the herpetic PCRs, but certainly it's worth doing in these undifferentiated cases where this is when I'll do a vitreous tap because the toxo PCR is not great on, the, on aqueous, I'll do a vitreous tap and I will send it for both herpetic and toxo, okay? Because why else am I doing this? I'm trying to determine between these two different infections that have two different treatments. Okay, so moving to the next case, 54 year old lady, unilateral discomfort, injection photophobia, fairly classic symptoms of acute uveitis. Systemically well, I've asked the questions. Okay, and this is her on examination. You can see she's got some anterior chamber reaction. Vision's quite good, bit down in the affected eye with the raised intraocular pressure. I've dilated the pupil and I can't see anything there. The vitreous is quiet. So my question to you is, you're trying to determine the diagnosis. Which of these investigations are you going to order? Okay. I'm not going to make you put your hand up. Okay. But you can see here that there is all of the above as being the option or none of the above is also the option. Okay. All right, so just think about what you're going to do here. So you can do ACE and chest X-ray, the syphilis, B27, whole lot of bloods, <coughs> rheumatoid factor, ANA, ANCA, anti-CCP. All right, now if you had chosen number nine, all of the above, you get these results here. All right, negative, negative, oh, I've got a positive rheumatoid factor, oh, and I've got a slightly raised ANA in a patient with anterior uveitis. So, Am I now stuck with a patient who's got rheumatoid arthritis and anterior uveitis? So is the uveitis due to rheumatoid arthritis? Okay, is it? No. No, okay. Anti-CCP is a very specific test for rheumatoid arthritis. It's negative, okay. So now you're stuck with a patient with these slightly abnormal bloods, which you don't know what to really do with, do you? Okay, and you know Rheumatoid arthritis is usually associated with scleritis. It does not present with uveitis, okay? The patients I see with rheumatoid arthritis with uveitis also have a rip-roaring scleritis, so it's a scleroveitis, not a hypertensive uveitis, okay? And that is the problem of indiscriminate investigations with Bayes' theorem, okay? The chance, the pretest probability, okay, of her having rheumatoid arthritis with her uveitis is far less than 50%. So you're left with a false positive and finding out more about this patient than you ever wanted to know, okay? She's got a raised ANA, I don't know what to do with it. So why order it, okay? So if it's not going to help you with your diagnosis, if you're not going to actually action it, there's no point doing it. Unless obviously they have symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, which needs to be followed up by a rheumatologist, not you, okay? You're really focused in this sort of situation with regards to her eye, you've done investigations that cost a whole lot of money and really have left you nowhere. Okay, all right, out of all of these, the only one I would do is the syphilis, okay? 
So this is a question you're now left with, but out of all of them, the only one I would do would be the syphilis, really, okay? The other thing also is that you may also consider doing an AC tap for herpetic disease, possibly. You don't necessarily have to, but it would be something that you would consider. Okay, and in fact, you could have avoided any of these investigations if you had examined your patient properly, transilluminated that iris, and you can see here the classic herpetic Transillum sexual transillumination that you see with herpetic disease. So again, the most important investigation in all of your uveitis patients is to take a decent history and a decent examination, okay? You knew from my presentation, you've got someone in their mid 40s, 50s, who come in with a unilateral hypertensive uveitis, okay? Herpetic disease until proven otherwise. Even with B27, okay, you're less likely to see any of those signs. They're usually hypotensive. Their IOP is not raised, okay? So herpetic disease, toxo is another one, but you have to exclude that posterior segment inflammation for toxo, okay? So again, the most important investigation is a good history and a good examination. Okay, so moving to the next case, 35-year-old lady who's come in with two-month history of bilateral red eyes, photophobia, increasing floaters and blurred vision. Okay, you can see here, she's got some anterior uveitis and you can see here, it's probably been going on for a bit because these look like fairly mature posterior synex. Vision, um, sorry, the pressure is slightly raised in one eye. So again, moving on to what are we gonna do now with regards to her management? Are you going to ask her more questions? Try looking at the eye a little bit more? order some blood tests or just start the patient on some topical steroids. Okay, just think about all of those. Okay, so you should now know that you have to do the history and examination. So ask her a few more questions. She's had a recent diagnosis of asthma with a chronic cough, shortness of breath and wheeze. And you may know that asthma is not something that you diagnose in someone who's in their mid thirties. It's usually something that has started off from childhood. So this should already be alarm, ringing some alarm bells here. She also has had some symptoms of malaise and loss of weight. And if you ask her about rashes, she actually said, yeah, sure. I've had these lumps on my shins that come and go. I haven't bothered asking anyone about them because they eventually go after about a week or two. And actually I've got some now and this is the rash, okay? This is erythema nodosum, okay? So you've got erythema nodosum that comes and goes in a patient with a granulomatous uveitis, okay? So you should already be thinking, oh, all right. And then if you looked harder at the eye, you will see these little conjunctival granulomas, okay? And if you look and dilated her pupil, you can see some sheathing, okay? And in fact, sometimes that's a choroidal granuloma on the nerve, all right? Most of these patients are sym uh, symptomatic with nerve um, infiltration and loss of um, optic nerve function, but not always. I have one patient who had, did not, and it was an unusual finding. So obviously this lady has sarcoidosis, okay? And has had symptoms of sarcoidosis prior to her, her onset of uveitis. Okay, now obviously in Southeast Asian countries, the other thing that we need to think about is tuberculosis, but certainly this young lady has sarcoidosis. And you don't always see these iris granulomas. It's kind of nice when you do, but what I really like seeing is the conjunctival granulomas because that's really easy to biopsy to give you that, um, that conclusive diagnosis. Okay, so sarcoidosis, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. It's a chronic systemic granulomatous inflammatory disease that can affect any organ of the body, okay, including the eyes, okay. The sarcoidosis patient is typically 20 to 40, mid 40s, females predominantly, okay, um, more, a lot more common in African Americans um, and up to 80% have ocular involvement. Usually it's dry eyes from the lacrimal gland involvement, but not always, okay. Sometimes it's uveitis, okay. Ocular involvement, classically it's a granulomatous uveitis, but it can actually affect any part of the eye and orbit, okay? With regards to the investigations, there's a whole lot you can investigate here. Um, of these, we usually do an ACE, a chest X-ray, and sometimes a CT chest, and you must rule out TB. 
Um, and that's where a biopsy is very useful. And if, with a respiratory physician, if there are any abnormalities on the CT chest or chest X-ray, they will often investigate further. Um, so your uh, respiratory physician will often help you with this. Now, with regards to the angiotensin converting enzyme, it is typically raised in ACE, uh, sorry, in sarcoid, but often there are confounders with regards to concurrent medications like ACE inhibitors that might reduce it. It's also a non-specific test, okay? It's not got a high sensitivity and specificity. It is often negative in a lot of our cases of sarcoidosis. Um, and as I said before, there are a lot of reasons why you may have a raised ACE. So again, it's all about collecting that circum circumstantial evidence to try and make your diagnosis. The chest X-ray, the findings, the classic findings are your high lymphadenopathy. Again, it's not greatly sensitive, but it certainly is useful, particularly when you have to also exclude the possibility of tuberculosis. And the CT chest is a lot more sensitive, but also a lot more expensive. Biopsies are very useful, okay? Because then you can also exclude, help exclude TB when you have a, um, a lymph node biopsy from the chest. But certainly with the ocular um, biopsies, doing uh, biopsying a conjunctival granuloma is very useful. Now, with regards to the diagnosis, we've got definite, which is uh, biopsy proven, and then presumed probable and possible, depending on um, what are the other systemic findings with regards to the diagnosis. Now, the conjunctival biopsy, again, very useful if you see these nodules. If you don't, the, the uh, rate of positivity drops, to, in my hands, less than 50%, really. Okay, bronchoscopy, again, your respiratory colleagues may certainly help with um, doing those. Okay, so we'll leave sarcoidosis to the side a little bit and we'll now go to the next case. We've got a 67-year-old male, five-day history of painless darkened vision in his, um, in his eye, in his left eye. He looks systemically well. There's no other neurological symptoms that I can see. Vision's a little bit down and he's got a supranasal field defect. And this is what you see. So he's got this infratemporal area of retinitis. Okay, not a lot of inflammation going on. And you sort of sit there going, oh, I don't know what this is. Okay, well, we know that you're probably going to do some investigations because that seems to be an undifferentiated type of retinitis. But the question is, what are you looking for? What are you gonna write on that request? Are you just gonna say, oh, herpes simplex and uh, herpes zoster and a toxo? Or is it something else? Now, if we took that same fundus photo and put it in a 32-year-old man who has the same symptoms, but actually also has some systemic symptoms, what, loss of weight, lymphadenopathy, and funny skin spots that look like this, okay? You'd be sitting there going, okay, this is an AIDS-defining illness. This is CMV retinitis, okay? And so, for our 67-year-old gentleman, what's going on here? Same fundus photo, is this CMV retinitis? Which you would have missed if you'd just done a normal herpes virus uh, PCR. Well, actually, if you took a history, you'll find out that he's actually immunosuppressed, undergoing chemo for multiple myeloma. And that is the reason why he's immunosuppressed, and that is the reason why he's got CMV retinitis. So again, the history, taking a thorough history will help direct you with regards to which investigations you need to take to actually make the diagnosis in this patient and start them on appropriate therapy. 12 months later, he's done very well. He's been given intravitreal um, foscarnet and also given uh, valgan sarcovir treatment. His immunosuppression or his chemo has been modified and he's actually done well. And you can see here that that area of retinitis is now healed. So the challenge in acute uveitis is determining the diagnosis, what are you dealing with, what investigations do you need to um, choose, and making sure, is this an infection? And if the patient is immunosuppressed, as with that left last case, it has to be, number one, two, and three. Okay, you really need to look hard for infection, number one. But how are you gonna tell that the patient is immunosuppressed? And the way, again, to do it is to do a really good history, okay? All right, infectious causes of posterior UVIs um, in the immunosuppressed, big long list, okay? I need to think about all of these things in immunosuppressed patients. But what is an immunosuppressed patient, okay? Essentially, it's all of these. So older patients, from the age of 60, your immune system is already not functioning as well as it should, okay? Chronic diseases on top of that, 
will certainly add to that as well. So diabetes is number one, okay, and then growing and growing, okay. And then of course, the chronic hematological malignancies and patients with concurrent autoimmune diseases. So we know patients with rheumatoid arthritis have a higher risk of herpes zoster. So you should be thinking iron in these patients, particularly if they're older, and also if they've got um, associated immunosuppression, which a lot of these patients do. So again, you need to think about infections in these patients, okay? We can also induce immunosuppression in our patients. So local injections, there are case reports of both acute retinal necrosis and CMV retinitis after an intravitreal steroid injection. Okay, so these are things that we need to be aware of. Okay, and obviously patients who have um, chemotherapy or immunosuppressed for other autoimmune diseases. Okay, so and I keep saying this, key points is always do a thorough history. Okay, always think infection and beware the biologics, which I will talk about in, um, in the next lecture. And just to finish off this lecture, um, this particular talk, I'm just going to finish off with this, this case here. Again, just to reinforce some points, 44-year-old Vietnamese who came in with sudden onset painful photophobic left eye, initially treated with intensive drops, okay, and then was given 50 milligrams of prednisolone a day when he failed to improve and developed a bit of a vitritis as well, um, in addition to this with his hypopian. He initially improved for a day or two on the 50 milligrams of prednisolone and then get a whole lot worse. Vision dropped to perception of light. And that was when he was referred to uh, my institution, who was seen to have a hypopian and a dense vitritis. Now, at that point in time, when we saw him, he literally looked like death warmed up, okay? He looked really, really ill and it established that he had symptoms of ongoing fevers, dysuria, headaches, and neck stiffness one week prior to the onset of his ocular symptoms. Okay. Now, unfortunately, this gentleman almost died in our eye emergency. He actually had a code blue, which is a cardiac arrest soon after his ocular diagnosis we needed to actually call an ambulance to get him into ICU. This gentleman ended up in ICU for seven days, okay? He almost died, he's 32, okay? What he had was Klebsiella pneumonia, okay? So he had Klebsiella pneumonia sepsis, he almost died from it, and it was certainly not helped by the fact that he was given prednisolone by his ophthalmologist. Now, all the ophthalmologists who saw him had to do when he first came in was to ask the question, have you been unwell recently? Okay. Have you had fevers, sweats, rigors before your eye went off? Okay. Those five, 10 seconds to ask that question would have probably saved this man five, 10 days in intensive care. Okay. He ended up losing the eye, but fortunately he did not lose his life. Okay. okay, all you have to do again is ask that question. This is a second fellow, 58, slightly older, blurred vision, similar symptoms, poor vision, and you can see that hypopian there. Okay, dense vitritis, AC cells. But this time we did ask that question. He came into my institution, we asked that question. He had three days worth of fevers, dysuria, lethargy. 24 hours before his eye went, okay? And he was managed in a peripheral hospital. He was given some IV keftriaxone, got better, but then developed rigors again a few hours after his ocular presentation. He had Klebsiella, um, Klebsiella sepsis, and you can see here he has multiple abscesses in his liver, okay, from this infection. Now, you can see here, that he actually had an abscess in the posterior segment of his eye there. He had an early vitrectomy, systemic antibiotics, and unlike the other fellow, he actually kept his eye with the vision of 618 a few months after. So it just shows you how important that early diagnosis is and keeping infection front of mind. And the only way you're going to detect this is to ask those questions, okay? It doesn't take you very long to save a person's life. So Klebs pneumonia, previously, prior to the 80s, it only really caused pneumonia, which is why it's called Klebsiella pneumonia. 
but it's when Taiwan, so in this part of the world, or sort of, we're a bit south, but in Taiwan, that the first report of pyogenic liver abscesses were found in immunocompetent patients that has a high rate of fatality, okay? Even higher rate of blindness, okay? High rates of blindness, high rates of losing the eye, and presenting visual acuity at the time of diagnosis is the best prognostic factor, okay? Late diagnosis, poor outcome, okay? There will be more to come though, and that's the reason why I've sort of raised it here, is that it's been identified as being an emerging global infectious disease, and certainly even in Australia, we are actually seeing more and more cases of this. So again, as more and more people start to mi uh, migrate or travel, these are things that we need to um, be um, considered. So, with Klebsiella pneumonia, certainly in Australia, we think of Asians with diabetes and a hypopenuviatus of acute onset as Klebsiella pneumonia and endophthalmitis with liver abscesses or gastrointestinal involvement until proven either otherwise. Okay, and again, just remember this, okay? Good history, good examination is the best thing that you can do to work up your patients with uveitis. Okay, always think infection, okay? to have a low threshold for um, a tap if you're not quite sure what this is, particularly if you think there's something in the posterior segment but not, are not sure. And if you're not sure, I would use oral steroids as opposed to injected steroids and I'll talk to you about that in the next lecture. Okay, always do, yeah, I think this is all about the same. And I think that's the end of that first talk. Um, there's a lot of cases there. I guess we can break for some questions at this stage before I go on to the next the next talk, which is really to talk about the managements.